Uh, this is typical, you know. <laughs> Did it survive? Let me see. You got it now? Yeah. <laughs> yes. You know what? I'm so happy about your mail because uh, the things you're doing is just perfect for this this particular podcast uh, and the, the topic, you know. And uh, when you're talking, I can hear from the little you wrote that you have a lot of experience. So what I'm thinking about this uh, conversation, I call it the conversation, not an interview, okay? It's like, um, I want you to tell me more about what you're doing first before we jump to questions about feminine leadership and stuff, you know? Because uh, I can hear that you have a lot from the field. And I mean, it, it's great to connect. And as soon as yeah. uh, I saw your call, I was, you know, something drew me to that. Mm. I felt like I had something to say from experience, but also from who I am as a person. Yeah. Um, so basically, I am a Cypriot national, um, living in Greece for the past nine years now. And um, my professional experience up to this point has been in relation to human rights, uh, in the humanitarian field, and as you, um, as you mentioned and uh, spotted, actually, yeah. <laughs> I had some experience in the field when there was the the big refugee emergency, uh, the refugee flags in Greece from 2015, like towards the end of 2015, and. Um, yeah, I worked in the field, like from first reception on the islands to uh, to further in the north part of Greece uh, after the closure of the borders and people were stuck. So I had that um, that field experience, but then I was quite based in uh, in Athens, so working more remotely for the field. But I was also called to. Um, attend to issues like when there were uh, emergencies, like the big fire that broke out on Lesbos Island and people had to relocate to a new setting, a new site or camp, however you want to call it. Instinct kind of kicked in and then it became more of a conscious decision that I wanted to shift to something new. I left my previous job 
I was kind of soul searching. <laughs> yeah. With a lot of, uh, I mean, when you work with refugees, it's a life experience in itself. Yes, and you know what? What I keep from that experience and what I recognized in myself is that the core element that's there, like the anchor, let's say, in me, is that I want to be a support for others and what I valued most through that experience working with refugees was really my interaction with people. One thing kind of led me to another in this soul searching that I'm uh, labeling this period and I was brought into a field that has that element again of supporting others and it's the field of embodiment. It's basically drawing from somatics work. It's like it's kind of a relearning and rewiring yeah. Yeah. of right. ourselves, how to be with ourselves. Right. And uh, it's something that feels aligned. This is uh, the feminine wisdom that we are coming into right now, right? Because um, you said you first worked with refugees and you got this human touch to it. And then you, you, you went for a soul search and then you found that embodiment is vital right for for any development and i think yes. that's just perfect in the core of feminine leadership because that comes you know into whatever we do of if whether it's business it's humans right it's humans that we work with and how we treat refugees has a lot uh, of mirror of how we are a society and how we do justice like you told on email like uh, the social justice, if it's not there, like you're saying, how can we embody this? Yeah, and, and when you experience it so much to the core as you do in the field, that's first when you realize how much is lacking, right? Because one thing is to be in the office or sitting somewhere very far away from the problem, which we are doing in the modern society in general. We don't go into the field and experience the, the challenges that are there and when you get it where, you, where you've been it must be the most you know it's the closest you can come to those issues it's like when you are facing it right there it's challenging and it, it takes a little bit of a strength from a person to, to realize or to get there I don't think anyone can just jump into it without being prepared but probably you already had a lot of core strength you became stronger right and now you know what this is about. Yes, I mean, I always craved human connection in that mm -hmm. sense. And uh, there was a big learning curve through my experience in the refugee field, for sure. And even when I was, you know, detached from the field, I still had very strong feelings about things and about cases that maybe I was handling or witnessing things or even hearing or seeing how the situation was portrayed in the media and misrepresentations about the whole issue. So this was like bottling up. So even when I didn't have that immediate connection to the humans, because I was right in the center of it, I kind of felt like it's too much, you know, yeah. Yeah. It's too much because like there's so many, there's only so many things you can do. And you understand this has a, this has a bigger issue, right? It's a greater, greater thing that we have to get into. When you say embodiment, can you tell me more about that? Sure. So basically what embodiment is in very plain terms is inhabiting more of yourself. So it is about personal growth. It is about transformation. Right. But it's uh, at the at the like core of it is accessing body based wisdom. Yeah. So what I'm doing is I am training to be a coach in that. So actually supporting others to access that information that's stored in their bodies, but it's not tapped into yet it's very exciting because having done myself having been on the receiving end of that i have seen how it has helped me accessing my own truth and what i want to do so i see that it works 
and I yeah. want to bring that to others. So, yeah. That's great. I mean, when you have that so much, like I said in the beginning, also such a touch to the, the, the core, that makes you also into the question when you have to decide, is this uh, going to change me or am I going to be stuck here? And what you, you did is something positive. You use this as a force, uh, as, a, as a way to grow. And that that's, you have to say, I'm good, right? Because because what you did was um, uh, the opposite. Some some people will get very down from experiencing something very hard and facing something that okay, this is problematic. We're seeing a lot of tra tragedy today that we can't handle because it's some others higher powers, you know, delivering the message mm -hmm. and doing doing decisions for us but you can't make your own decisions like what you did it was a decision i'm going to use this as a force yeah so that's that's amazing and i i like to know like how did you get from there and to today somewhere you say that you have uh, leveled up kind of i was like in the privileged position mm -hmm. to take that time and take that space to to do my soul searching okay. and to see where it would lead me you mentioned leveling up i would say that i feel like i'm spreading out so like yeah. maybe not going <laughs> not you know way. not this direction <laughs> but this That's, way I, I would say you know just to correct yeah. myself a bit because leveling up sounds like you have to climb something for me yeah. i would say if you go this way, it's more a level up because that means, uh, in general, it means that you get a better, better sense of yourself mm. and also others. Mm. Like you, you, you embrace more of the world, the contrasts of the world, and you're making more space. And this is also what this is about, like discovering that we are together on this planet about all the challenges. Like when I said in my bio was that I have no one above me, just you beside me. Mm. That was kind of my my introduction to my bio was to write something like, I want to make a community that has all these voices that wants to express what is going on. Then you can actually make changes together because it doesn't have to be you alone doing this, right? And that's kind of the new power, I think, is the feminine power, you know? And how do you picture feminine leadership mm. power? Yes. So I have an issue with the word leadership. Like yeah. I have maybe with other words because they are very, you know, loaded with, uh, with meaning. And, you know, when you say a leader, you always have this, you know, image popping up, which is so ingrained you know, by society and by the systems we live in, right? So uh, to me, like female leadership or feminine, as I wrote to you, because I think there is a quality deeper there that it's available in all of us, despite of gender identities and whatever. Um, it's basically living by example, being there to bring the best out of each one. A, a leader is someone that paves the way in a way that other people find their way too. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So that I think sounds, that's... Hmm. That sounds like um, uh, in the ancient times, we were leading by example a lot more than we do today. And uh, it's interesting when you mention it because there are different leadership types. And the only leadership type that we kind of see today is more like the authoritarian or the one that um, is very political or the one that is very biased. But when what you say is that leading is also about leading with people and on the people foundations, right? Basically, in the beginning, it was quite hard for me because I was uh, very disconnected from my body and who I am like I, I felt that and how I, how I always refer to that uh, situation is that my voice was silenced through the situ through the work situation that I was in before that's the physical like sensation that I had that my voice was silent but somehow there there was like a little um little voice somewhere uh, saying that, okay, you need to move on to different things. 
In the beginning, it's very hard because, as you also mentioned, we have these societal pressures and expectations of how you should move on. And okay, your high esteemed job, you know, something that is stable, something that is high earning, also for Greece, uh, and you move on. Even if it's not spelled out, you feel it in you that there is this expectation. You need on to move on to bigger things, you know, like even bigger or even at the same level, something that carries the same esteem or credibility or but just stay on that path. It took some time for me to be able to reconnect with my body and uh, my feelings. Uh, essentially, even though I took some steps applying for jobs in the same field, like something did not feel right. Like just, there is just something that did not, you know, yeah. click. I, I can feel it because I think we all as women also, but also mm. in general, uh, despite this, who we are, uh, we do a lot of things of expectations, like you said, and, and what is maybe subconsciously uh, driving us. I think that we are running away in society a lot from ourselves and we're making these steps of what we think is going to make us feel better and then we just get more and more empty the longer we step away, right? We cannot, without the leader that hasn't got to this point where they can also be empathetic and you know with themselves and others because it has more than just the paragraph right it's also about understanding the human behind it resonates with me when you talk about empathy and how i think that's why that feminine leadership or generally feminine qualities can can bring that change because it's yeah. it's very tied to compassion yeah, and great and to cooperation rather than competition that we are so like working we're learning to live yeah. and work in competition and not in cooperation with each other and yeah and i think we are on that path of the talk right now where we know that this is kind of a path that is already there and given to us except that we also have to embody this and we didn't do that because we follow the same streamline that they already said from us. Usually they blame things like, okay, we can say it's a lot about capitalism, but on the other hand, you know, patriarchy is strong today. And it is something we don't talk about so much in society because most leaders, well, sad to say they are men. And then when women try to voice these problems to, to patriarchal issues, you say also we get silenced a lot because we it seemed like a competition that women wants to take over from men this is not what it's about this is about trying to get the same equality of voices and to you know understand that we have been suppressed in the past mm. for a very long time and how can we actually uh, without realizing this has happened we can't change it and we have to admit yeah. that, you know, when I, I'm kind of in the moment a little bit angry because the world is kind of messed up. <laughs> so it is. Uh, with everything that's going on, I just get more and more angry. And that's why I also started this project is because if I didn't do anything about this, I would just go crazy because this yeah. is like <laughs> everything that goes yeah. on. You can say it's a lot of wars in the world, which is true, but we forget also there's a war against women. Yeah, for centuries. But, you know. mm. And if we are going to be honest, like, wars are honest. masculine, right? Let's be <laughs> wars, <honest. laughs> wars are masculine. I mean, there yeah. it's it's from that, like, masculine energy of, yeah. like, wanting to exploit resources and wanting to, like, trample upon people for yeah. profit. Like, it's, that's what it's born out of. 
It's it is true essential. because it's, yeah. I mean I, I don't mean to say that all men are doing this, but they no. have to realize that if we're gonna be honest about it, uh, the people that exploit others, it comes from it's, it's a long time of colonialism. It used to be a lot of men in there, but you know, the resources that we haven't had the domination of. And if we don't have it, it's not about that we want that resource, it's about that we want mm. access to change the distribution and the unfairness of this resource. Exactly. And women can have a say into this in a more compassionate way, like you said. It, it is not about matriarchy, but we need this kind of... We need this. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and that like reminds me of uh, the phrase from Audre Lorde that says that we cannot dismantle the master's house using the master's tools, which is uh, exactly that, that having, you know, this possibility of women and generally feminine femininities to, to speak up and voice their concerns and not only envision the world and how it's that going to be, but play an active role in it, then it's yeah. it's going to change things, not for, for women to come on top, but for having a more equitable society. Exactly. And I, and, I yeah. really do, you know, it, I really do believe that. I do also, because I think that when, when, when women get access, even though they say there's a lot of equality because of female leadership has become uh, more visible, it doesn't mean that we are where we are supposed to be because it's still... You know, there is so much talk about, yeah, leadership and women entrepreneurship and all the, you know, relevant situations like getting women more into positions of power, political power. I think there is a pitfall there. Just because of how society was set up mm -hmm. historically, women may also endorse masculine characteristics when they're found in that place. And it's just perpetuating the situation. And, Very interesting um, part. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I feel that there is a lot of work to be done there with men that hold decision-making positions, of course, but also with women that theoretically are there but are embracing more masculine characteristics just to survive in that yes. space. And just because they tie you know, being emotional with being unprofessional. Uh, but something that I have experienced. So it's like, it's okay yeah. to feel and it's okay to, you know, to not know sometimes. It's okay to be in a space of not knowing where to go and like working together to find a way forward. You don't just have to push your way through and your position. What you're saying is so true because it's more than just a position. It's not only about positioning mm. that for females to take part. It's also that it's not just about your title, equality when it comes to yeah, salaries, positions, uh, awards, things like that. It's about your experience, how the organization is done, perhaps the strategy, how we think about an implementation what we can see forward, all those things that is more, mm -hmm. more than the position. And then, um, like you said, I've talked to another coach about the same thing. He says in the inner patriarchy mm -hmm. is a lot about um, how women don't recognize their own patriarchy. That's going yeah. on when you are at the same level as men, maybe it's a parroting their lines. They're doing what they have been told to do. Women get rewarded if they do as good as men has always done, like you know, and that's what he calls the inner patriarch, especially yeah. if, if the industry is already very masculine and they get like, Oh my god, a woman can do this! Oh, she's so clever, you know, and she gets the same salary. Wow, you know, and then you're still kind of the same patriarchal structure mm -hmm. that we don't realize because we're just so happy that we got the same position as a man. It's, like you said just right now, was that um, 
there's a big pitfall there. Yeah. Mm. Like, how can we actually, and you are doing a lot of, yeah, you're doing a lot of transformation. I can hear about your, your job now and what you're doing in your project to change that. And I think that's very interesting because I can see already that's a need. People being on the front line and people being at the receiving end that are maybe suppressing the feelings they they have from the experience, from their work experience, uh, basically, and how to help navigate them through, you know, this body-based learning. It's uh, it's influenced by somatics work because there's a lot of this. Uh, it's not just the regular coaching where you just thinking and you're using only this part of your of your yeah. body you're not you're not head, you know, <laughs> you're not just mixed head. up <laughs> you're not you just are head. More than this. <laughs> <laughs> so there's yeah. a there's a lot of like tuning in and the role of the coach is to create that safe space and that safe container where you can like drop into your body and tune in and see what insights are revealed, maybe in images, maybe in sounds, maybe in physical sensations, something that, you know, cannot be explained or what bubbles up, what yes. comes up when, yes. when you pose the questions as a coach. Yes. So deep down there was an inner knowing, <laughs> it's just that you didn't notice it before because you, you didn't have the, the way, maybe. So, so it's a little bit like, it. you know, when you have um, phobias for things, for instance. So I, I did a emergency crisis course once when I did uh, about ship rescue. <laughs> I did things like that. But it was a 14-day course because uh, one time I really wanted to be on the seas and just to help people on board, you know, and then you have to have an emergency crisis rescue course. And... 90% of that course, I thought it was going to be technical, but oh no, it's only psychological. It's only about, you know, getting to the core of your fears and, you know, to talk with your body. And then, you know, um, he was very good instructor because he got a conversation with all of us, what we fear the most to find the source about this. It could be from your childhood. It could be from your parents, it could be from an episode that you experienced when you were in a closed mm. room and you couldn't get out of it, things like that, you know? Just a little small episode could cause your whole phobia, right? Of and course. Like, yeah, because I had a lot of claustrophobia. And then he said, ship rescue is perfect for you <laughs> because you will have so much claustrophobia, you're going to be in a... A dark room with a lot of smoke and we're gonna test you so much and i was like i can't do this and he said so so well, you're thrown into like the very <laughs> center of your fear right <laughs> yes and well that was it with embodiment we work on the edges so right. it's not like where because that might be re-traumatizing right <laughs> was and yeah. you know what i didn't expect that to be the course at all because this was in northern norway in lofoten where they had um, a lot of tourists come in so we had to protect them if something's going to happen to them most of them are if it's on the sea if they get seasickness or if they had a lot of trauma from an incident on board you had to know how to handle those people without mm. you know the technical mm -hmm. stuff did all the technical stuff because we had to yeah. deal with their emotions if that happened. And then it was like, <laughs> all right, um, uh, so I have claustrophobia. I was going to work with the fire on board in a ship. How's that going to work? You know, and be thrown out in the water. What can I do? <laughs> and, but he did it perfectly because he, sh he started with showing us a video from a, a ship that was uh, sinking and mm. how, how the rescue team came with their floating boats you know and stuff like that and most of that video was about traumatized patients after the incident and how to calm them down to this is just an accident it's not about you you're not going to be traumatized forever because this is the ship it's not you All yes. this, you know and what you're talking about as well is that 
to find you doesn't mean that it has to be what happened to you. It doesn't no. have to be what happened. It has to be you. That yes. Right. Because also, you know, we talk a lot about how we are shaped by our experiences and by, you know, our our memories of that experience, but those can be very deceiving as well. If there's like, it's not yeah. like a memory, it's a true depiction of what happened because there's always the feelings associated with that and that could could have that event distorted from real yeah. events. Yeah. And, um, and I think, well, even even me saying I think all the time, it's like it's like we're so ingrained to thinking, but the, always with the thought there is an associated feeling to say I think or my experience of fear from like twenty years ago, but how I remember it is the feelings that that generate it. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I, I think that we are underestimating feelings in society in general because mm. it's like we are driven by logics like you said how to do things to get better but in the end we are driven by feelings a lot more than we think mm. we are. and maybe those are temporary but still they kind of shape us so to get to the core of the problem sometimes you can't ex escape your feelings because that's mm. only going to make it like you said yes. bottling, bottling up and then to a certain point where you go almost insane if you don't do anything about it, that might be the point where you have to decide, okay, I'm going to make this as a course or I will be just drowned. And that's why I think it's so impressive what you do to yourself, that you can inspire others to do the same or with their own experiences, you know? I don't know I don't know where I read something about feminine economy and how to be part of that shift towards changing how the economy works the mindset you have to yes and it's like you have to bring in more models of uh, enterprises that are female led and are based on the principles that we have talked about yeah, yeah. it's like how are you expecting you know capitalist economy to change or shift become more equitable or you know like um be more respectful for the planet for resources in general if you do not put yourself yeah into and it and slowly create a ripple effect. Yes. <laughs> right, ripple effect more, uh, more and more come into that. <laughs> right, because I mean, we can't escape that we are in a monetary system still. So yes. we, are, we are in a profit-based world, meaning that, you know, it's very much uh, like I was before non-profit as well, because I did a non-profit mm. magazine for a long time because I was state-sponsored, so that was okay. <laughs> but, you know, yeah. at some point, uh, when I'm now, it's I, I make it a disclaimer in my bio that this is not a mm. profit, it's not a charity. Ooh, sorry, mm. my coffee spilled. Oh no! Yeah. <laughs> All the coughing up. I'm glad. Was there a lot of coffee left? Yeah, the whole oh, coffee. Oh. oh no! I'm more concerned about my phone actually because I've lost it so many times and so many things. Just hope. <laughs> Thank you Making so much. The, the waitress is perfect. She's doing all the job for me. <laughs> uh, this is typical, you know. <laughs> Did it survive? Let me see. It's an Yay. iPhone. Yay! <laughs> iPhone, they should survive things like this. Wait. I'm okay. I just think about my technology here. You know, it's short of coffee and now it's <laughs> energized. <laughs> I'm used to water. I'm not afraid of water. It's just, I'm afraid if my technology doesn't work tomorrow, I can't have a job. <laughs> I spilled everywhere, you know. <laughs> Can you believe how dependent we are on technology that uh, you know, yeah. if something happens like this, if it just breaks down, we're just finished. We just we don't have a job tomorrow. Whenever women do a business that is 
primarily to grow. She's immediately seen as she might be not conscious about others, she might be selfish, she might be greedy. All these things that is not fair because that's how men have driven all their business yeah. all this all this time. And uh, what you said is that it's very important to get into the activity mm. that can make real changes usually when we are aware of how we enrich women developers as you know we're not assistants we can also be entrepreneurs we can also be um, mm. the drivers of the change and for that we need capital because otherwise yeah when i did my non-profit we also had a little profit but it was at some point the magazine had to decide are we going to go full profit or are we going to uh, start a new project or stop the project we went eventually made made an end to it and decided that this was the non-profit project the next one is going to be our business and then how you know things mm. change because mm -hmm. you have a concept and the concept you have to kind of follow but then concepts can also develop we have a little bit from the old times still that women are the helpers yes instead of the drivers right mm. Yeah, but even in our role as helpers, we do not value the help we're giving sometimes so much as to charge for it, like put it bluntly, yeah. you know, <laughs> like, um, yeah. yeah, we'd rather, no, we'd rather, but it's, we are taught that, you know, like our creativity and that comes down to, you know, the creative impulse, I think, like yeah. that is very shut down and it's, because also like helping and being there for others is like you're creating connections. It's still born out of that creation. Um, so I think that's, yeah, I think that's why it's very, uh, you know, um, undervalued even by women themselves because of how they are taught that this is no, it's something you should do anyways. It's not something yeah. that you should you should do to, you know, as a job or as a or to receive income from it. it. Comes a little bit from the old housewife thing. Yes, that's what I was gonna say. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> you took it out of my mouth. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> I was gonna say that you know this is also because of the roles of of women or the mother, the one that's, uh, you know, different yeah. roles that, right. <laughs> yeah. you know, very traditional values of how a family should be and how a family should look like and who should be the breadwinner. Okay, if women are housewives, it's totally fine. And it's totally fine though, if women are the breadwinners and women are the ones that are you know, bringing the income into the house. And it's not about uh, that work yeah. more, it's more about we are expected to work regardless of what we get back from that. Like you said, it's like a bit um, the traditional, it comes from uh, when women did things voluntarily to help the family when mm. the men were outside. It's like, uh, it's kind of an extended arm from that, that we're still not realizing that we're, we're putting on ourselves, maybe more than the men do, but we're putting it like, okay, I'm compassionate about my house and my family, so why can I not be that in the society without mm -hmm. expecting that I'm gonna flourish? Because it means that we have put ourselves uh, secondary, the primary is to help others, but you know, helping mm. others should be enriching for you because that's a part of a human being. So when you're coming to that point, when you realize that this is making me grow, that's when you realize that, okay, I deserve a space into this and have a say into this because this makes everyone grow. I think men more has this naturally from, uh, it's not expected from them, but it's been pushed from very early on that they can do this without consequences. They can just, you know, push forward and help others, but still be the, the savior, let's say religion, which is, I think, 
it's a bit of an excuse on the same time it's true that religion put these traditional values and roles that you know you have in every religion is the father the mother the child it's, it's more than this it's like how we are relating to these roles still yes. no matter no matter if you're religious or not you're still doing it because it's automatically part of the system still very masculine it's how yes, it is. what's ruling today is more like oligarchy. We're saying about ourselves that we stick to human rights, but do we actually do that when it comes to women, when it comes to workplace, when it comes to traditional values that we have or don't have? Um, mm. you know, and then the helping hand to somebody in need to come to somewhere they were supposed to be taken care of or welcomed, and maybe they were for a second or, or two days, you know. And maybe we're still there, where we have not um, got into the main problem is human rights is not complete in, in our developed society. Human rights, I mean, it's very relative and the issues faced in Greece and in Europe with treatment of women and violence against women, you see that it's very prevalent. So. Uh, it would be also the easy choice to blame it that it's, yeah. you know, the outside the culture acts this way. Look how yeah. men are treating women, you know, in such, yeah. such country. This is just, it's like a smokescreen for what yeah. happens in your own uh, neighborhood. And there are still, I think there needs to be a will to acknowledge mm-hmm. Yeah. This takes place in your next door. Yeah, yeah. next door. Yes, yes. <laughs> I'm, and I'm, I mean, but feminine leadership can help about this. Is also that we are easier to be attentive to injustice because we have experience from that in ourselves and from our history, mothers, grandmothers. Uh, and the female history. It is easier for us to adapt that, see and recognize other people coming that has no access to the same rights as we know. So I think that as long as we yeah, get more influence on these workforce, not only, like you said, individually, because of course, when the system fails, individuals, it's up to the individual, but ultimately we have to kind of make a great better system you know yeah and i think women you know inter intergenerational you carry this injustice as you rightly say like from mothers grandmothers from right you know even from somehow from women from other parts of the earth feeling i would say again of the collective you know injustice that women have suffered throughout the years so women are more tuned in into identifying when injustice plays out and it's not something that i think men has to be afraid of like you also said they might appreciate more than we think uh, a better uh, understanding which they yeah. might want in the end so i think that yes. we are underestimating the male appreciation of the people hmm. and that's why we need to work with men as well and helping them find the feminine qualities in them. It's females recognizing them, but in the end, uh, all human beings have the feminine energy. Mm-hmm. And like you say, the males might be the one that we need to guide them to this feminine energy because we embody this. Like you say, if we can, all the women, let's say on earth, embody this energy, imagine the power, you know, and then just to power is contagious. So if we just, you know, adapt to this quicker, then the men will follow. I'm absolutely sure.